Hey guys, this is unit four, segment two notes. Um, with this one, we're gonna cover more causes for climate change and plate tectonics is one of those things that you can't ignore as a possible natural cause for climate change. But just seeing the words plate tectonics might make you think you know, that the earth is this active planet that has um, outside plates shifting along and moving, creating mountains, creating crevices and all kinds of trenches and craziness. Now, is that a fast process? Answer, no, that's not fast. So this again is a long-term kind of climate change situation. So the movement of the continents, it's really the continents you guys that we're focusing on because that um, land actually absorbs that energy much more than the water does. So as far as creating any temperature changes or anything like that on the planet, we oftentimes will focus on where those continents are. But the movement of the continents actually affect where the wind patterns are, those global wind patterns you learned in the last unit, where the ocean currents go, um, are they deflected, which way, you know, how do they break up that motion and that heat delivery. The amount of solar radiation reflected back into space, this is called albedo, this is a brand new word, and I want you to say it, albedo, albedo, reflectivity. So a mirror is going to have 100% albedo, 100% reflective. And if it, you guys, if it doesn't reflect, if it doesn't have albedo, then it's going to absorb. So the opposite of reflection is absorption. Keep that in mind because if you see a beam of sunlight coming in and it reflects, it's going to bounce back in the same angle that it came in as, right? But if you have absorption, you're not going to have any bouncing. It's going to take it in and convert it into heat energy. Heat we know is connected to climate change and especially global warming. So albedo makes a big difference on climate change, big impact, I should say. Large land masses, when they're near the poles, the trend is this. So we have an increase in glaciation at the poles. And I always just tell my kids that, you know, land is a place for the snow to accumulate. Okay. If it hits water, water has a higher heat capacity and so it can melt the snow. But the land is going to be colder and therefore the snow will accumulate on it. So think of it like that. If you have land masses near the poles, you're going to have more glaciation. You're going to have more glaciation at the poles. And you guys, how bright is it on a sun, um, winter day, sunny winter day, when you go outside, how bright is it? Very bright because that albedo is very what? High. High albedo, high reflectivity, less absorption. And if it's reflecting and not absorbing, what happens to the temperature? Think about it. If it's reflecting and not absorbing, then what's the temperature going to be like? If it's not absorbing, it's not converting it to heat, so it's going to be cold. And therefore, we have an ice age situation. And this is just one factor, guys. This plate tectonics is one of many. But the trend is that. On the opposite end, when we don't have large land masses near the poles, then we have less ice buildup, therefore less albedo, therefore an increase in temperature, and this can be global warming situation. And the, the visual that I have here is Pangaea, the single continent, as it broke up and the plates moved around and the continents have shifted where they're at. This is present day. Um, the evidence of this motion, and there's so much evidence, there's rock evidence, um, sedimentation, all kinds of evidence, but the one I decided to list here is that there's plant, tropical plant fossils on Greenland. So indicating it was once you know, closer to the equator than what it is right now. Plate tectonics. Sunspots. Sunspots are, um, an indication of sun energy. And this image was shown a uh, surface of the sun in 2001. And this little blue dot is an earth comparison just so you can see how big the, the sun is for one and how big these sunspot areas are. We don't exactly know, we know that the sunspots are connected to the magnetic field lines that are on the surface. Um, we don't really know why they build up and then go go away you know we can't predict when they're going to happen as far as like where on the surface it will occur how big it'll be um, but we do notice that there is a trend and so you can see dates along the bottom of this the graph and then up the side would be the number of sunspots 
and you can see you, this is cut off right here. I know that, but the year 2000 is right here and the year 1980 is right here. So you can kind of see that there's this boom peak and, and dip and peak and dip and the peaks represent times when the sun looks like this, when it's covered with sunspots. And then the valley are times when it's just quiet. Peak, quiet, peak, quiet. Now if it's peak and there's a lot of sunspots, that means that the sun is very energetic, okay, more than normal and it's releasing more energy. Guys, that's putting more energy coming across space and being hit and put into our earth system. So the no, an increase in sunspots equals an increase in energy given off by the sun. And if more energy is coming from the sun and hitting our planet, then that's more energy in the system and it's going to generate a higher temperature for our earth system. That's the trend. So the sunspots cannot be ignored as a possible cause for climate change. Now, compared to the um, Milankovitch cycles and the plate tectonics, the time frames for the sunspot activity is much shorter. It's every 11 years there's a peak. So it's different, it's a little bit shorter scale, but still something that you can't ignore. Oh, I forgot to mention too that the opposite would be true if there was less sunspots, there'd be less energy and lower temperatures. Okay, another natural cause for climate change would be volcanoes. Um, volcanoes are unique in their natural cause because they can cause both cooling and warming. Um, so let's talk about these. They also can be short term and long term, but extensive volcanic eruption increases the amount of, oh, sorry, increases the amount of dust and the amount of sulfur dioxide that goes up into the atmosphere. Now, what's interesting is that with the dust and the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, it's now blocking the sun energy from hitting the surface of our planet. So it's if there's an increase in albedo, it's bouncing back out into space. So extensive volcanic eruption on the short term are going to increase the albedo and thereby decrease the temperature because it's preventing that sun energy from hitting the planet. Think of it just blocking out the sun. Long term though, with extensive volcanic eruptions, there's more than just dust and CO2, or, um, sulfur dioxide coming out, there's actually CO2. And we learned CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And so once the dust settles, now you have the CO2 floating around. And that, you guys, as a greenhouse gas, will do what to the temperature? Increase. So volcanic eruptions also put out that pesky CO2. And once the dust settles, the albedo lowers again, and now you have the greenhouse gas kicking in and taking in that energy and converting it into heat. So therefore, more heat, increase in temperature in our system. And there was a sweet um, line of evidence in 1991 when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted. And the following year, global temperatures fell um, half a degree Celsius, 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit. The, yeah, so there was an interesting um, collection of data there. This is that eruption. You can see it would it would block the sunlight for sure. Block the sunlight, powerful. And this person probably screaming, help, right there. But anyways, um, once that dust settles, though, now you have the CO2 impacting, and so temperatures won't fall. They're actually going to rise. All right, you guys. Last cause of climate change is and one that cannot be ignored just like the others is humans. And there is a vocabulary word called anthropogenic. You need to say it, anthropogenic, anthropogenic, human cause, anthrohuman, genic cause, anthropogenic, human cause. All right, so what are we doing? Well, a lot of things. Now, these are just a couple of things that we're doing here. Um, we're gonna get more into the greenhouse gases on the next segment. But these are just a couple of things to kind of kickstart it. We deforest our forests, friends. We are cutting down the forests, and thereby um, we know that the forests pull in the CO2. So if we're cutting them down, well, I have to show you all of this before you can see the arrows. Um, we're increasing the amount of CO2 that's floating in the atmosphere because it's not pulling it out. When we increase the CO2 in the atmosphere, you guys, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and thereby increasing increases the temperature. So this is kind of restating what I just said. So deforestation 
decreases the trees. You're cutting them down. Decreases the trees that pull out the CO2 and thereby increasing the temperature. So these are saying the same thing. Um, burning fossil fuels. What does burning fossil fuels do to the CO2 in the atmosphere? Increase or decrease? Hopefully you said increase. And then with an increase in a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, you must know that it's going to increase the temperature. Um, humans, as humans, we do other things too. We have, we like our, our meat, we like our beef. So we have cow farms and cow farms, you're going to find out cows um, excrete methane, which is a very uh, potent greenhouse gas. We also use fertilizers that release another greenhouse gas. So there's all the things you're going to learn later that humans do that produce um, greenhouse gases. So really the anthropogenic set side of things, it's really all about greenhouse gas emissions, about nothing else but greenhouse gas emissions for anthropogenics. The Mauna Loa um, carbon dioxide trends, this is a very famous set of data and a very, very highly recognized graph. Um, the trends are such that you see a dramatic increase in carbon dioxide levels. Mauna Loa is in Hawaii. It's in the middle of the ocean, um, unobstructed by surrounding uh, pollution or anything like that. So it's catching what's globally being distributed. So it's a very unbiased location to be collecting data on this kind of trend. But I'm going to show you this in class. We're going to see the, the graph. But it shows that there's a dramatic increase in CO2 emissions or just um, amount in the atmosphere. And we also know that since the Industrial Revolution, we've been burning fossil fuels like mad. And so they're just kind of piling up and accumulating. And so that trend is pretty consistent. And it's actually consistent with many of the other greenhouse gases, too. OK, I think um, I think actually I need to cover feedback loops with you. So in a really quick format, we're going to positive feedback loop. Positive, you guys, does not mean good. Please get that out of your head right now. This is an action that enhances a phenomenon. It continues that phenomenon. So if we talk about global warming, it's going to be something that's going to continue or enhance global warming. So more warming. An action, and go ahead and put that right on your notes. More positive equals more warming. With the, okay, so soot on glaciers increases the absorption of the energy and the conversion into heat. So thereby increasing the surface temperature. Okay. Negative, on the other hand, though, are any actions that will reverse the phenomenon. So if we're talking about global warming as a phenomenon, we're talking about cooling. So please write down near your negative feedback loop, please put cooling, leads to cooling, okay? So large volcanic eruptions, blocking out the sun, that leads to cooling. That would be a negative feedback loop for climate change, for global warming, I should say, okay? And we're going to talk about more examples in class, but that is it for... Um, segment three.